Finally, in any study of civilization, the one thing you learn it is not the final judgment does not lie in arms. It lies in the human soul. You can be literally, and don't make, I'm, this, this has nothing to do with whether you have religious faith or not. This is sheer pragmatism. This is a fact. You can really upset a civilization if you start releasing a body of truths that really upset the ground upon which that civilization is based. It is an incredible thing. It's worse than a bomb. Worse than a bomb. And it, 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 it has incredible effect. It literally weakens the ground. That is the reason why Africans managed to gain some measure of independence. It's, it's only the first phase. But the reason why they managed to gain some measure of independence is because the gross immorality, greed, and viciousness in European society released a man like Hitler. Hitler was a logical result of what was going on in European society. And he blew the whole thing up and weakened them so much that they no longer had the power to stretch out their and the moral confidence to hold on to our people and saying about they're giving us a new life and new souls when their soul was so corrupted that even the beasts would not have done what they had conceived of doing. And this is what upsets civilization. There is a more, there is almost as like if you build a great wall against the ocean and it has a little hole in it and you begin to dig at that hole until the thing starts to crack. That is what is happening now. And with each new fact, could you imagine Oxford saying that? The Oxford High Mythology Unit admitting at last that not only is man African, but modern man is African. Bomb. Well, what is the value of that? So, so what was all that? What you gonna, where are you going to drop the atomic bomb? And on, on, are you going to drop it on a Johannesburg? Um, you're going to drop it on a Bantu stand? And it's going to blow your own self up? Look what has happened to the RAN. Look what has happened in the banks. They're retreating. It's not, it's by no means a victory. It's a long way to go, but the hell with it. Something has begun to happen, and it's not going to stop happening now. That is the reason why one has to be extremely committed. Because this, there has come a point now where something has begun to crack, and that is the time when you cannot under any circumstances pull back. Every, every army of thought, every, every knowledge that we have, every new fact that we have must be thrust at them with great force so they can't retain them. No compromise. No compromise at all. No, that like this kind of shit coming out of Portland where this woman is saying for the sake of balance, let us say we made slaves too. Our slaves were different. There was a different code for slavery. It's not the same thing. It's qualitatively different. Don't give me that. Don't try to excuse these people and take their irons out of the fire for them. When we and our forefathers were burning in fire, they didn't pluck us out of any fire. They, they, they added more coals to the fire. So they don't need to have no irons plucked out of them. Let them learn that there is a penalty in the world. You cannot go on oppressing people and building a system whose whole basis is the depravity and the deprivation of a body of people and then expect to get away with it and then have some jolly nigger smiling up at you say yes sir yes sir, it's all right sir yes. we are very happy sir yes. because that is exactly what is happening in that kind of attitude and we have a lot of blacks around like that <laughs> one of the remarkable things that happened in the umayyad dynasties the Al-Marabi then the Al-Mahadi, the last dynasty with the Al-Mahadi dynasty is the fact that the two major things that were responsible for European supremacy 
was not created in Europe. Most of us think that the Europeans had fine ships, that's why they were able to cross the ocean, whereas no other people were able to cross. Hundreds, nay thousands of ships plied the Indian Ocean, both Arabic, Arab ships as well as African ships. The Indians made an African admiral of the Indian Ocean, a people known as the Cities. African sailors who were so skilled in crossing the ocean that the Mughal emperors made an African admiral of the Indian Ocean. The caravel which Vespucian Columbus used comes from caravos, which is an Arabic word which comes from pangalos, which was used on the Indian Ocean by Arabs and Africans. The sails that Columbus and Vespucci used were Arab Latin sails that Arabs and Africans were using. It was not European sails. The compass was not developed in Europe. It came out of China as a result of the Moorish conquest. It was refined by the Arabs and brought up by the Moors into Spain. The astrolabe was not developed in Europe. None of the nautical instrumentation, therefore, with the possible exception of a certain kind of rudder, which was, even that was a refinement of the axial rudder that had been used in Egypt and passed on to the Arab world and then into Europe. Neither their sails, nor their rudder, nor their astrolabe, nor their compass originated in Europe. And at the top it all, Fire sticks, the first machine, the first firing mechanism to shoot bullets were created by the Arabs. The, the, the Russians are shown in recent documents. The first use of firearms in the world used by the Muslims in India. The Moors took that and brought it into Europe. So even that the Europeans didn't invent. Gunpowder was invented in China. Gunpowder was also used by the Egyptian priests with opposite effect. Gunpowder has also recently been discovered to have been used very early by the West Africans. It was not used for that purpose. People say, well, why didn't the Africans use it to shoot? Gunpowder was actually, do you know that the Japanese had, were the first people to use cannon? And do you know when they surveyed the battlefield, the cannon was banned? The Japanese would not use the cannon for centuries. Because when they saw the massacre created by the cannon, their moral conscience was so appalled that they stopped the cannon. The European moral conscience wasn't appalled. He made bigger and bigger cannon. Yeah. All of these things have something to do with it. Yeah. When I interviewed Dr. Quarterman, Dr. Quarterman who died three years ago, he was one of the six black men who worked on the atomic bomb. And I said to him, Dr. Quarterman, people will ask me after you're gone, why did you do this? You knew that you were making an atomic bomb. Why did you enter into these kinds of activities? And he said, don't be a fool. I'm a scientist. I'm not a politician. I recreate the world. I have created things that even God has not created. I have taken things that God left with one molecule and I have made three molecules. I have created totally new compounds in the world. And I was working on the Enrico Fermi. I did my quantum mechanics on him. I was working on the Enrico Fermi in Chicago for the peaceful uses of the atomic bomb and on the Einstein for the atomic bomb in New York. I, I can't choose what I do with my experiments. I created, I took U-235 and made it into U-238. I was the first man to do that. And that led to the Oak Ridge nuclear facility. What people do with what I create, I, I create. What they do with my creations is a different matter. I can't determine that. That is determined by people, their moral conscience, their governments, their administration, etc. Because I had my hands. I had my hand with God in Chicago, my hand with the devil in New York. And that's how he dealt with it. And those of you who have been in positions of res great responsibility and power, you know the enormous conflict that exists. Either you were allowed to continue your work or you don't continue your work at all. 
It takes a tremendous courage and you luck, a lot of luck because you could be blasted out of existence. Because don't make any mistake, they don't have to shoot you anymore. They just have to place you in a situation in which you, you, you kill yourself. And when I say kill yourself, I don't mean literally take a knife or a gun. But you could be placed in a situation in which you work yourself to death. Here am I. I have spent eight years developing the Journal of African Civilization. I'm the only person there, you know. I have no staff. I can't afford a staff. I have somebody who helps me for two hours on Saturday to send out mail. I have to solicit articles. I have to edit them. If they send in with bad pages, I have to retype them. I have to deal with all problem mail. I have to deal with the bookstores. I have to write the editorial. I have to put all the stuff together. I have to arrange the sequencing and the arrangement. I have to determine what is to be published and what is not to be published. I have to organize the research materials. I have to proofread it. I have to distribute it. I have to do the counting. I have to count to the IRS for every book sold. All one thing, in addition to doing new research, in addition to teaching full-time classes and traveling in 18 to 20 states giving lectures. Now somewhere along the way, one is going to crack because that's what happened to Diop. Diop just cracked. He just blew up. He was a young man. Diop is a strong young man. You may not have seen Diop. Diop was only 61. He's extremely vital and so forth. But he is trying to get power in Senegal. Head of the Black Research Association in Africa. Doing linguistics with UNESCO in Cairo. Following up mummy studies. Head of the di director of the radiocarbon laboratory traveling to different countries, giving lectures. So one night he goes to sleep and his heart stops. It races and races and races and it stops. If you were doing what they want you to do, you would have laboratories and grants and secretaries and secretariat. You wouldn't even have to lift up the phone and say, hi, get me so and so. That's, that's how they get you. They make sure they may not touch you after a while they realize it is pointless to touch you because you could cause them more trouble than they're prepared to deal with. So they stop, they leave you alone, really alone. And they make sure that you are going to run that story in such a way that eventually you're going to trip yourself. Because if you don't trip yourself up with your mouth, as Parakan did, you're going to trip yourself up in another way because when I say trip yourself up in mouth of Farrakhan, did I have a great respect for Farrakhan's courage? In, in order to show that, I appeared on Farrakhan's platform in Chicago a year ago. Boy, did I get hell for that. I'm not going to even go into it. <laughs> but, well, I was asked if I was anti-Semitic. <laughs> And they said, first of all, they're, they're, if I, I want to know what Semitic means because I have done a lot of studies and I really haven't been able to define it. But if it means anti-Jew, I said that is utterly impossible because my doctor is a Jew. My lawyer is a Jew. My accountant is a Jew. My publisher is a Jew. The dean of my faculty is a Jew. How could I be anti-Jewish and survive? I spoke on Far Farrakhan's platform because Farrakhan, on that count, while I may disagree with some of the things he may say, we are both devoted and committed to the upliftment of black people. It is in that sense we are brothers. And I spoke on his platform because of that. Everybody who wants me to speak, I would speak on their platform. So they said to me, would you speak on the platform of the Ku Klux Klan? I said, of course, they need to be educated. <laughs> they thought they had me there. They said, if the Ku Klux Klan is ignorant enough to invite me, I would, I would be very happy to speak on their platform. <laughs> 